This conference will now be recorded. All right, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Kevin Goodwin, president of Overwatch Financial. Kevin, thanks for very much for uh, being with us today. And the focus here, we have um, a couple of agents that have been with us for uh, three weeks and uh, uh, one agent that's starting uh, this week. So I'd turn it over to you in the interest of time and really appreciate everybody being here. So thank you everybody, here's Kevin Goodwin. Okay, um, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically talk about how I use Para. Uh, I've been on the Para program for almost three years now. Uh, it's kind of evolved a little bit for me, um, but this I'm going to focus specifically towards investment advisors and how we can use it. Uh, Para is a great source uh, to bring clients in qualify them and then determine uh you know how what we want to do with them at that point in time so most of you guys probably have your own processes that you use when you bring a client in um, do a needs analysis and then move them through your process the way that i use para is first off it's great that para gives you the ability to um, one of the things that always impressed me about para is the fact that they're able to coordinate with your calendar so they're really it doesn't stop you from doing whatever other marketing or whatever other uh, method you're using to bring in clients because Para is going to be able to sync with your calendar uh, and only assign you appointments uh, that your calendar is going to permit. So really it's a great way to kind of fill in those blanks. Uh, so if you're if you've got a great process, you've got you just need more people to put into your funnel. Um, uh, Para will help fill those blanks, help get more people into your process, into the top of your funnel for you. So basically the way I've started to use Para is exactly as that, is, uh, you know, I, I sit down and I, with those appointments, um, and, and I, I approach it as though I'm just, I'm just there to, to discuss with them their pension, um, and then determine really if they qualify the rest of the process um, and so you know a needs analysis a full uh, you know analysis that we, we would put them through and that type of thing so it, it's really simple when you're getting the activity of these appointments that are generated for you at low cost they come in they're put right into your calendar and when I sit down with someone I, I just basically just go through um, first thing I do is I just say hey uh, you know Glad you, glad you met with us. Is there anything specific when you got that email that made you want to schedule this appointment? Because I want to make sure you get out of this appointment what you came here for. And that really starts it off where, hey, I'm just here to make sure that I take care of you. I'm here to make sure that I give you the information you need. And then I'll also say, you know, or is it more just general information? See where you're at, identify, you know, what you need to do in order to hit your retirement goals. And that really opens you to the rest of the conversation and opens them to why you're there. Now, one thing you'll notice, those of you that have had paraleads or are getting on para, is one great thing about the paraleads is that they they came with the intention to discuss finances with you. Uh, some of you may have run lead programs where they think they're getting an iPad or they think they're going to draw, be drawn for, I, I don't know, some prize, some event, something. But what they're not prepared for is to sit there and talk about their finances. And that is something that we don't uh, see with Para. We get a live mean, I, I was quite impressed in the first few weeks and few months that I was doing it where I mean I'd come into the meeting and they would literally be sitting there with their 403b statement in front of them and their paycheck stuff of sitting there um, so it was great to be able to meet with people that had the intention to sit there and discuss finances that's why they scheduled the appointment uh, it was not something where I was having to reach out to them chase them you know that type of thing it was it was just very simple and they were there they were ready to talk and at that point in time, it's up to you to, uh, you know, they Para's gotten them to the table. Now it's up to you to not screw it up. There's really what it comes down to. There's a great line there in the movie Hitch uh, uh, where he's telling people how to get in front of a woman. And he says, just don't screw it up. Okay. 
So that's kind of the way I look at these leads. So you, you've got a good high qualified person putting in front of you. Now, you know, we've all run across leads where it's the lunch lady or it's staff or they, they just, and I just look at that as lost leaders that, you know, it's I'm that much closer to the next lead that's gonna be qualified. I provide a service for them. I, I sit there, I do the pension calculation with them. I tell them, okay, this is how much you're gonna have. Um, and is there anything else I can do for you? Now, I, I have kind of a form I use in my office. And the first thing it does is in that form, it has basically the pension calculation. So I ask them the questions like their average monthly compensation, or I take a look at their paycheck and we calculate that together. Um, and then we basically go through the formula, how many years of service, what the multiplier is for that state, uh, you know, what their average monthly compensation is and say, okay, here's your pension amount. And oftentimes if people are kind of surprised, pensions aren't what they used to be. They don't replace 100% of their income like they used to. So when I tell them, okay, so we've got about 70% of your income replaced, um, how would, would that be difficult for you to live off 70% of your current income? And most of the time it's yes. And that's really your pain right there is what we call our gap. Um, and I tell them, you know, that's, that's my job is to make sure that you understand that gap there's other things that you can utilize in order to create pain. One of the great things that I discuss with people and I say, you know, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news. And so don't kill the messenger here, but there's something that somebody's probably never told you. And that's because of your state pension, your social security will be taxed. Okay. So basically social security was designed to be tax free, but the IRS doesn't like those two words. They don't like the words tax free. So what the IRS did is they came up with um, a special provisional income calculation. And when you use that provisional income calculation, it determines how much they're going to tax your social security. Well, because of the level of income you're going to get from this state pension that we just calculated for you, 85% of your social security is going to be taxed. And you know what else? 85% of your husband's social security is going to be taxed as well. So that creates this gap. And so my job for you is to number one, make sure you understand what that gap is. And number two, identify what we've done to correct that. So how much have you started putting away or how much do you have saved um, to help fill that gap in from your pension? And then that opens the conversation right there. So if you've created a little bit of pain right there and then you said, hey, you've got this gap, you've got a bigger problem than you think. Um, what have you done so far in order to fix that gap? I mean, it just opens it up and then they start giving you a lot of information. Oh yeah, I've got a 403B with this much money in it. I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. So it really just opens that conversation and opens that door. And then at that point in time, you're able to then maybe qualify them, pre-qualify them for what process it is that you may want to be putting them through. Do you want to do a full financial analysis? Um, do you want to, you know, maybe they, they're they very young teachers and they just want to start $200 a month into a 403B or a Roth IRA and you're able to help them with that if that's, uh, if that's all they're qualified to do. So, but it really just opens the door using that process. But I always look at it for the ones that really don't qualify for moving forward in my process. I always look at that as just, hey, uh, I'm going to provide a service to her right here, right now and maybe I'll get a referral out of it. Maybe she'll find great value in the information I give to her. So I'm gonna give her this 30 minutes um, and I'm gonna do my best to give her some advice, to help her out, uh, show them what we can do. And she, she may end up loving everything I say and say, hey, you know what? I've got this other teacher right down the hall. Let me go grab them because they wanted to meet with you too. And then you end up getting that, uh, that referral. Maybe that's a higher qualified uh, candidate. So, um, you know, you, you'll hit some of those that uh, that you know aren't as qualified. But I'm all, all in all, I, I I have a big, extremely high close rate, uh, high success rate with pair appointments. Um, I just enjoy going into appointments that they know why I'm there in the first place. So it looks like on this slide there's some questions here. So hopefully that kind of gives you guys an intro as to how I use it. I basically am using the pair appointments to qualify for what 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 process am I going to put them through. Uh, are these a, uh, uh, a managed money candidate? Are they, you know, are they, well, you know what, what is it that I, what I'm looking at or that they're capable of doing or how can I help them and, and what process am I going to qualify them to put them through? 
So let me go through these questions here real quick and then we'll do some Q&A. Uh, I believe these are items that uh, John had basically, you know, a lot of the questions that you guys had already asked John. Um, so what is your process for when you receive an appointment notification up time until the time appointment is held? Really, uh, up until the uh, COVID happened, uh, we didn't communicate with them at all. Um, we basically would put them into our database as a lead. Um, then we would, uh, we use Salesforce. So we'd throw them into Salesforce as a lead. We'd create the, the meeting appointment. And until we actually met with them, uh, we don't communicate with them. Now, the reason for that is because Para will actually credit you anybody that cancels um, if they cancel based on their communicate on Paris communication. So Paris sends them a reminder, okay? Paris sends them a 24 hour reminder and that way they can reschedule. So let's say something comes up, they schedule it a week in advance, something comes up, they get that reminder, they say, oh, I can't meet at that time. Then they can click on that link in that second email that they got. Um, and then they can go in and they can reschedule it. Okay, so if they reschedule and then it, you get notified, hey, this person has changed their appointment, they've rescheduled it. If they cancel, then you'll get notified, hey, this person has canceled their appointment. Uh, and then you just take it out of your calendar. You don't worry about it. And you'll never get charged for those because, so that's the big reason why you don't reach out to them because you want all the communication to be with between them and Para. Uh, up until the actual time that you're meeting with them. Now, the only thing that changed there with COVID is at this point in time with COVID, we do two things the night before, like four o'clock before my staff is leaving. They will send out a text that basically says, hey, I am shooting you an email right now with your Zoom link for our meeting tomorrow. Look forward to meeting with you. Let us know if you don't get the email. And then they'll send an email with the Zoom link. So we do notify them via text and email. So we notify them by a text just to say, hey, we're sending the Zoom link. Then we email the Zoom link and that way we have a high probability of them getting it, them checking their junk mail if they need to, um, so that they have that, that Zoom link so we can jump on the conference. Uh, the question here is, do we send our own reminders? We answered that. I answered that. We definitely do not allow the pair of reminders to work for you. They do work well. Um, they already, I mean, the first email they got from Para that, that they clicked on that link to schedule the appointment in the first place, after they clicked on that link and scheduled the appointment, they got a confirmation email that has a link in it where they can change or modify or cancel the appointment. And now they've gotten a 24 hour ahead of time reminder. So allow the Para system to do what the Paris system does and don't don't finick with that. Otherwise, you know, because if you communicate with the client and then they cancel directly with you, you don't get credit for that. So allow the para reminders to work for you. Um, do you prefer your first contact with the client via phone call or video conference? I always do video conference. Um, there it is amazing how much communication you do not get. Uh, you know, I, again, I know I I I there's over 70% of uh, communication is nonverbal. So if I can see a client and I'm saying something and they look confused, I know immediately they're confused and I need to spend a little more time there. So I almost always do video conference. And to be honest with you guys, at this point in time, we are now six months into this pandemic or five, I don't know, it seems like forever, but we're a long ways into this people are used to video conference. There are very few people that have not used it, are not familiar with it, and now they've been forced to become comfortable with it. It is now standard practice. So uh, utilize that to the best of your ability. I mean, it's great if you're able to have an appointment through Para, have that appointment be a 20 minute, 30 minute appointment, and if it's not qualified, you know what? I never left my office. It took me 15, 20 minutes. I ended up getting a Zoom camera set up in my conference room and it's real simple. My staff goes in there and sets up the appointment, waits for them, they walk into my office, say, okay, your client's in the conference room and I walk into the conference room, I do the appointment. It takes me 15 minutes and now I know if they are qualified, if they're not qualified. If they are qualified, I schedule them for our next appointment. If they're not, then I'm done with them right there. I didn't have to go anywhere. I didn't have to drive anywhere. I didn't have to do anything. Um, it's just a very, very easy way to 
have a, a, a great deal of number of appointments come in that you're able to then qualify and determine how you want to move forward with them. Um, how do you typically approach your first appointment with a client? I kind of went over that. Uh, and if you have any more specifics that you guys want, we'll go over that in the Q&A. Uh, have you learned about paraclient? What have you learned about paraclients since you first started receiving appointments? Uh, hmm. I, I, there, it, it's it's varying. Uh, one thing that you'll notice is you do have quite a few teachers that are married to teachers, so you have a multiple household there. Uh, you also have a lot of teachers that are married to successful uh, business owners, uh, attorneys, doctors, that type of thing. So uh, there's a lot more money there uh, than you might think from a teacher's standpoint. Um, and they they are are very motivated to work with uh, work with somebody that they trust that they can put to put their stuff together that they understand. So um, as far as best practices, you would suggest agents that are new to pair appointments. So the one thing I would say you do want to do, especially as an investment advisor, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of tell you how I handle the question of who are you. Uh, why am I talking to you? Are you an employee of the state? Because that's probably the biggest hurdle that a lot of people have with pair appointments. Now, you have to understand how they're communicated, how that appointment got generated for you, okay? An email went out and it basically said, because you're an employee of the state, you have the opportunity to meet with somebody to discuss your pension, to discuss your, your, uh, uh, your 403B, to discuss your things. So, they, it doesn't say we are employees of the state. It doesn't say we're employees of the school district. It doesn't say that we're employed by a sponsored organization of the school district. It just says because you're employed here, because you are an employee and a participant of this pension, you're entitled to this meeting. And honestly, if it goes down to the bottom, I believe at the bottom of the email, there's full disclosure that says this is uh, provided to you through para, uh, public employee retirement assistance. Um, but do people read all the way down or do they say, oh, I need to meet with somebody? Yeah, I'll click on the link and then they go and click on the link, right? So I, I know that legally every single one of the communications para has has a disclosure that we are not employees of the state, that we are not employees of the, the district. Whether people read that or not, you know, that's that's on them. And it's kind of, you know, the way it's worded, it's kind of, you know, they, they 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 think that it, it is unless they read the full disclosure okay so um what we do at that point in time is we ask them I, I i just very clearly say to them hey um what uh sorry i was reading the chats there um let me tell you exactly why you're talking to me today so first off public employee retirement assistance is a national company they meet they offer pensions the ability to offer a one-on-one -on -one meeting. So any participating, any participant with a public pension is entitled to meet with a pension consultant. Um, and there are some IRS rules that require pensions to offer a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And so by para offering that to the state pensions, they be, they're able to satisfy that IRS rule and they're able to give their participants the opportunity to sit down and meet with somebody. And so PARA offers that to every state pension and every state pension participant. Now, I personally am a pension consultant. Um, because you guys are investment advisors, you can also then kind of give them whatever other credibility you want, whatever other uh, designations you may have to basically say, uh, you know, this is why I'm specifically qualified to meet with you today to discuss your your needs. So whether that be if you're a fiduciary, you can simply say, hey, I, I'm a pension consultant. I've been trained on your state pension program. I'm a fiduciary that, uh, you know, that I have to, by law, make sure that every everything I do is in your best interests. Um, so that type of thing, whatever you want to use there is your designation, your disclosure to satisfy, number one, your compliance department, so that so you know that you know they weren't being misled or anything like that. So go ahead and do that right up front, uh, close to the appointment. Now, um, I don't necessarily do it right up front unless I'm asked, I'll be honest. Um, what I typically do is I get into getting 
to know them at the beginning of the appointment. I do the, hey, you know, how are you handling the whole COVID craziness? Okay. Um, so how long have you been at this school district? What exactly do you do for the school district? Okay. Uh, how long have you been here? How And, you know, when do you want to retire? And then is there anything specific as to why you wanted to meet with somebody today? Because um, I want to make sure you get out of this meeting what you came to get. And so then you're really kind of satisfying them and taking care of them. Um, and if they ask, I'll, I'll give my disclosure right then. Otherwise, as we're going through it, what, after I determine what their gap is, I'll say, okay, so let me explain to you exactly why you're meeting with me. And then I'll give the disclosure and I'll say, so what I'm focused on for you today, based on our discussion thus far, is this gap that you have, this 40% gap that your pension's not going to cover for you. You've also got that social security gap that's caused by the taxation on your social security. Um, what are we doing right now in order to make sure that those things are taken care of? And then they open up to you, they give you that information, you can go. So you can kind of feel that out as far as how you want to play that. Um, or how, what, I, or, I'm not how you want to play it, but necessarily how, what order you want to do it. If you want to do the disclosure right up front, feel free to do so. Uh, it doesn't hurt at all. Uh, sometimes it'll open them up a little bit if they know they're speaking to a professional that's qualified that you know they feel comfortable with. I've been doing this for years. I could probably count on one hand the number of people that basically said, well, since you're not with the state, I don't want to talk to you. Um, so uh, very, very, very relevant. Seldom do I run into that. Um, but so that's that's what I have there. Um, okay, best practices you would suggest to agents. Um, you know, you you got to have your own process. You got to have your the way that you kind of work those. Um, you're typically going to be talking about a, a multi appointment sale. So if you're not getting enough appointments, you need to make sure that you have your calendar fairly open. I would say that that's one thing a lot of people do is, you know, they have a lot of clutter in their calendar and then Para is seeing that, their, their automated system is seeing that so the appointments aren't coming through to you quite as much as maybe somebody else that's in the same district that has a wide open calendar. They're going to get more because if the person selects a time when you're not available, it's going to go to that other agent. So try to clean up your calendar. If you've got stuff blocked out on your calendar, the only times you should really have blocked on your calendar are times that you're actually meeting with a client or you don't want to receive appointments between that time. So if you don't want to receive appointments in the morning uh, before 9 a.m., that's fine. If you don't want to work past six, that's fine. Go into the para system and block out your time in there and it'll block out that time so you won't receive time appointments in those time zones, in that time frame. Uh, and then try to keep the times that you do want pair appointments as open as possible. Um, so those are my recommendations as far as making sure that you're getting your pair appointments uh, and getting those through uh, to the best of your ability. So can we um, can we go ahead and just unmute people rather than going through that? And yep. then we'll kind of discuss that. If you guys have a lot of background noise, just mute yourself. And then when you're going to ask a question, unmute yourself so that way we don't have a lot of uh, background noise. But I think it's easier to, to communicate with you guys if we can have a two-way conversation rather than reading chat questions. Um, so, uh, George, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask? Uh, no, Kevin. Thank you, though. This uh, The information you shared is uh, very helpful. Okay, great. James, how about you? Uh, I'm trying to unmute James. There, James, can you hear us okay? All right. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep, go yep. for it, James. Okay, I do apologize in advance if there is any background noise. I'm sitting in the lobby of a hotel right now, so. <laughs> We're all doing <laughs> a little differently nowadays anyways. That's fine. <laughs> um, I did have just a couple of questions. Um, one of the questions is, um, how far of a financial analysis do you go down uh, as far as like including, you know, social security, spouse's income, uh, any other like benefits as far as like grants and um, um, just, I guess, minor things that might be an infliction on a person's retirement? Uh, I mean, how far would you go into that? Well, it really depends on if this person has assets or not. Um, 
So if the person doesn't have a lot of assets, you're kind of going to just wrap it up pretty quick in that appointment. But if they have assets or, or you know, hey, how much do you want to put towards that? Oh, I can put a couple hundred bucks towards it. Uh, OK. And then you, you know, you can have that discussion. So if you've created the pain or the concern of the taxes, talking about the Social Security taxation, talking about how they're 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 they're. they're uh, Pension is going to be taxed. Now their social security is going to be taxed. And I use this a lot, to be honest with you. I'll say, you know what, if the, whether they're putting into a 403B or not, I'll say, you know what, I really, really, really hate the way that they push 403Bs on teachers. And it's really a shame that they do that or they do the exact same thing to police officers and firefighters with the 457s. The reality of it is because you have a pension, you are already in a tax hole in retirement. and because you, if you're putting into a 403B or 457, you're only digging that hole deeper. And do you think taxes are going to go up in the future? Are those going to go down? You know, and there's not a single person I've asked that question that thinks they're going to go down in the future. And you're right. You know, you're at 15% right now. When the 403Bs and the 401Ks were invented, that was in the 1973 when 70% was the top uh, uh, tax rate. So those guys at Johnson & Johnson that went and lobbied to have the 401k was because they were trying to get out of having their money taxed at 70% and wait to take it out until like today where we're at a 15% tax rate. That worked really well for them, but it's not going to work well for us. We're going to be saving right now where we have a 15% tax rate, and then we're going to take it out later on down the road with whatever that future tax rate may be. So... Typically, I am going to be looking at other alternatives and other options to you like a Roth IRA or a Roth alternative if you don't qualify for a Roth. And in those instances, I do use the IUL. That's one of James's questions there. Do we use the IUL? Yeah, I, I absolutely will look at using an IUL. Uh, you know, I, I, I start that conversation right there in the first presentation. Hey, I'm going to be looking. I'll even come back to you when we meet up and show you options for a 403B. I'll show you an option for a Roth IRA, and I'll even show you an option for a Roth alternative. So I'll give you a few options, and then you get to pick from one of those three when we get back together. Um, so that's one way to do it for somebody that's not qualified, doesn't have a lot of assets. You're not going to put through a lot of process, okay? Okay. Um, but if you get in front of somebody, they've got a couple hundred thousand dollars in a 403B, they have a self-employed husband that has old 401ks where they've got a couple hundred thousand dollars there and you want to earn that business uh, or some AUM business or management business, annuity business, whatever it is, that there's some opportunity there. Um, what I do is this, is I say, you know, you get two things out of this meeting. The first thing you get is you get this meeting where I'm going to explain your pension and answer any questions that you have specific to your benefit from your pension. The other thing you get, and I, I've started offering this to clients for at no cost, completely complimentary, because I'm a fiduciary, I can't make recommendations to you unless I know those are in your best interests. And Really, I'll come into these meetings oftentimes and people say, hey, Kevin, should I do this or should I do this? And to be honest with you, it's tough for me to give you an answer exactly what you should do unless I've done the research. So I know that what I'm giving you is exactly what is the best, best situation for you. So what I would recommend we do, and I offer this completely free to anybody that comes to me from your school district. Um, it's complimentary. And, and there's no obligation to work with me going forward. But what I'll do is I'll do a complete financial analysis. And I will bring in all of your accounts. I'll analyze every single one of your accounts. I'm going to forecast. I'm going to apply inflation to that. I'm going to apply your taxes to that. I'm going to figure out your Social Security optimization. We're going to look at your investments and see what your retirement accounts are doing. We're going to see how they're returning. We're going to determine how much risk you have in your retirement accounts and how much risk do you really want to have in your retirement accounts. But I'm going to give you a full financial overview so you're going to know exactly what it is that you have. And based on our conversation so far, I really feel like that's what you're really looking for. You're looking for some answers. You're looking to be able to make some educated decisions. And in order for me to give you the information you need to make those educated decisions, 
I've got to do that analysis, and then I'm going to provide that analysis to you at no cost and no obligation. Now, when I do that, I'm going to identify things. Inevitably, I'm going to identify a few areas that we do need to fix. I'm going to show you what the red flags I'm seeing in that analysis is and, and where we need to fix things. And then if you would like for me to then fix those issues for you, then I'm happy to discuss our fee structure as, uh, and, and how much that would cost for us to actually go in there and actually manage your accounts from here on out and, and make sure that we hit those retirement goals for you. So those are the two things you get. You get this 30 minute interview where we actually discuss your pension and then if you would like to, I'll schedule a time to meet with you and your husband and we'll go through a one hour interview and really figure out exactly what it is you guys need, what you want. So that's my process. Uh, you know, that's what I, my, my pair appointment is really pitching my process, pitching the analysis where I'll do the analysis for them. I provide them with that information and then I... But I, I got to be honest with you guys, and I, I don't know what your guys' process is, and you guys can all have your own process. But if you look at the way I'm doing it, there's a few uh, sales uh, principles or, or emotion principles that I'm applying here. So the first thing is I'm offering them something for free, and it's really easy for people to say, oh, yeah, I want that, because it, it's something they want anyways, right? It's, it's great information. You're offering to give them free information about their retirement. Who doesn't want that, right? Especially if you have a an example of the report that in the analysis that you're going to give them, and you show them the charts, and you show them, all, oh yeah, I definitely want that. I've never seen anything like that. That's great. I want that. So it's real easy to sell them on something that's free, right? And any salesperson can sell them something that's free. <laughs> so you get them to sign up, say yes, let's go ahead and have that second appointment. Then you schedule the one one hour appointment, and literally that's all you've done so far is schedule a one hour appointment get them to agree to that one hour interview. Now in that one hour interview, they then start giving you personal information and then you really start talking to them about their dreams, their goals, what they want, and you start to get to know them personally and you start to sell yourself to them. And that by the end of that one hour interview, hopefully you like them, hopefully they like you, but now they've put an hour, a total of them, maybe an hour and a half into this analysis that you're preparing for them. So when you give them the homework and say, okay, in order for me to complete the analysis, I need your Morgan Stanley statement. I need your uh, 403B statement. I need your mortgage statement because I got to calculate when your mortgage is going to be paid off and how that affects your retirement. I need to do, you ask them for these things. Guess what? They've already invested so much time with you. They're already so invested in this report that if that's what you need, they're going to give it to you. I can, again, probably in, the three years I've been doing pair appointments count on one hand the number of times people haven't given me the reports and, the, and things that I've asked for. So now they're an open book. They give you a ton of information. They give you everything. Um, then when I do my actual uh, presentation of their analysis, I go over their stuff. I don't actually give them any recommendations in my second presentation. I basically tell them, hey, here's the things that we're doing right. Here's the things that we're doing wrong. Here's the things we need to worry about. Here's what concerns me. Hey, you have way too much risk. Hey, your risk tolerance score is an eight. You may not have known this, but your investments are invested at 55. And with the market volatility right now, with COVID, not knowing what's going on, we don't know who the president's going to be next year, all that kind of stuff. We got a lot of volatility. We need to get your money out of that out of that position where you've got a lot of risk. So it's really easy at that point in time to sell them on signing up with us. At that point in time, I don't have them sign up on a product. I'm selling them again on me. Uh, and ultimately, that's what people are buying nine times out of 10. They're buying you, not what you're selling them. So at that point in time, I have them sign a client engagement agreement, and I let them know that at that point in time, they are uh, a, a client of Overwatch Financial. Um, and, and again, what they're doing, and if I met with them in person on the first, on the, on the interview, on the back of my interview book, I have a privacy statement, and I have them sign that privacy statement, basically acknowledging that we're not allowed to share their information with anybody, blah, 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 okay? So what I'm doing is I'm creating a habit that every time they meet with me, they sign something, okay? So now the second appointment, at the end of the second appointment, I put in front of them the client engagement agreement and they sign it. And now, I, again, they have a habit. I'm training them, 
hey, when you meet with me, you give me some information, or I give you some information, you're going to sign a, a piece of paper. So the next appointment, when I actually give them my recommendations, guess what I'm putting them in front of them? Another piece of paper they need to sign, but this time it's the application, it's the ACATS transfer, it's the account opening, it's whatever it is that I need to get signed from them or get their stuff taken care of. So, um, and the other principle there is, uh, the other sales principle there is, uh, when they sign a client engagement agreement, so let me ask you something, James. If you sign up with an attorney, and you pay him and you sign an, an agreement with an attorney or a CPA or a doctor or another professional. So you signed up with them because you trusted them. When they come back and they make the recommendation, are you gonna say no to that recommendation? No, you signed up with them. You signed up with them last week. So mentally, they've already made you their advisor They've already slept on it. They're already 100% comfortable with the decision that you're their advisor. So the sale is not even a sale. It's just, hey, this is what the problem is. This is what we need to do to fix it. And this is the account I'm going to put it into in order to fix those problems for you. So sign right here and I'll get that taken care of. That's literally my sales presentation. Okay. Um, so that's the process that I personally use. Uh, generated a lot of revenue off of doing that. Um, it takes care of my clients. Uh, it takes care of, uh, you know, it really does. We have a very high success rate uh, processing it that way. So uh, hopefully that helps answer your question there, James. Did you have another question? No, no, um, that sounds uh, pretty good. It, it pretty much sums up my last question. If you use any kind of certain tools or software like Money Guy Pro or something similar to that for your financial analysis, but if you're deep diving that far, then it sounds like you are using some kind of software in that nature. Um, yeah, whatever you want to use. My, I, I do a Morningstar report, I do a risk Alize, and I do a retirement analyzer. So those are the three reports I'm running for a client and going over with them. And then I have my own little template that I use for my analysis. So basically what I tell them is, hey, I've run three reports for you, and here's my analysis of those three reports. So they're actually getting four different documents from me, but yeah. Okay, and you said um, you typically, uh, between the number of appointments that you you said, it's, it's around a, a three-sit appointment. First is just a, a general introduction conversation icebreaker and then second is you know this is what we can do for you and the third one is is really the breakdown in our, out of everything and then you know selling whatever uh, you, you feel like is best yeah so it's really if i count the para appointment it's four it's four appointments uh the para appointment though is typically very quick it's 15 30 minutes max yeah uh, and then i'm scheduling really my the whole purpose of the para appointment is to qualify the lead for the process determine if I'm going to move them forward in the process and then to sell them on the process and get them scheduled with their spouse and get them in the spouse at the next appointment. So that's my goal in the para appointment. And then we have our first appointment, which is our interview, our second appointment, which is our analysis presentation and our client onboarding. And then our third point appointment is our actual, um, we call it the resolution where we, uh, we uh, actually assign them uh actually start moving their accounts and setting up their new accounts okay perfect appreciate that thank you all right paul do you have any questions all for right. it yes kevin i got quite a few questions but i think at least for one of the questions see i seem to have gotten some of the answer from you when you start a conversation with a, a para lead how do you start out asking questions which lead to the fact finder? And is the fact finder at the second appointment and at the first appointment, you're, you're only exploring whether it's worth going deep into fact finder? Yeah, the first appointment is really, I want to get a general idea. Are there assets here? Are there not assets here? And, and that doesn't take very long at all. The reality of it is, is that how you get people to open up is by creating a little bit of pain. Um, that's how they then open up and they start telling you about where their accounts are, what their accounts are. And to be honest with you, I've never had a problem with somebody not just, oh yeah, here's what I've got, here's what it does. You know, I, I never had a problem with that. Um, because I use that gap, 
uh, as kind of the trigger. And then if I need to create a little more pain from the gap, I use the uh, social security taxation. And I'll be honest with you, very, very few people are aware that social security is gonna be taxed. So that that is kind of a shock to a lot of them. Uh, it's kind of a blow. So uh, now you're creating the need for them to give you information because oh my gosh, I'm 40% short. Oh yeah, I could never live on $2,400. I'm used to having you know, 5,000, whatever that is. Um, so now you've created that little bit of panic in their, in their, in their you know, that little bit of anxiety for them. Um, so when you ask the next question, uh, they, they, they're very willing to answer those questions and give you the information that you need because you've created that that anxiety and so now they want you to resolve that they want you to you know you created the panic now fix it for me you know what i mean um well, and, and yeah. that's really what what you're able to do there and that's why they give us any information we ask for at that point in time yeah so that's the question i wanted to ask you uh when you're starting your conversation how do you find the pain points and how do you know how much gap is there? How do you create anxiety right from the beginning? So right at the beginning, you know, you're asking them, okay, how long have you been at that school district? Okay, so how many years do you plan on staying? So if you're 46 years old, do you plan on going to 65? Okay, we got 21 years to work with you. Uh, you've already got 11 years of service. That gives us 32 years. And then I do the formula. So what's your average monthly salary? Or I have them give me their pay stub, which most of them have there. Uh, and then I calculate what their average monthly salary is and I do the pension calculation for them. I say, okay, uh, based on 26 years of service, uh, a multiplier of 2% uh, and your average monthly salary of this, based on my calculations, you're gonna have a pension payment of X, Y, Z. So you need to know what that pension calculation is for the school districts you're going into what pension program they're in. I don't think any of you guys are in California, but if they were, are they on CalPERS or are they on CalSTRS? You need to know that before you walk in the door. You need to know what points are, okay? And I don't know if, if your program, if your school district works with points or not, but some of the pensions have a point program where you have to have 80 points or 90 points in order to be able to get your full retirement benefit. Most of the time, points are real simple. It's years of service plus your age. Uh, some of the uh, pensions will have a 55 plus five rule where they have to be a minimum of 55 years old and five years of service to get a pension. So there's, there's differing rules based upon each state. So all you need to do is if you Google your teacher's pension plan in your state, um, they have a handbook. Every state pension has a handbook and just familiarize yourself with that handbook. Um, uh, get very comfortable with it. If you're not comfortable quoting, quoting, you know, things right off the top of your head, then carry that handbook in your bag when you meet with them. Or if you're doing the virtual meetings, have that, have that handbook right there. And you can say, you know what, let me just double check. I got the handbook right here. I want to make sure I give you the right information and open it up and look at it and make sure you're giving them accurate information. But um, once you've done once you've done it for a little while, once you've done enough of the appointments, you'll be familiar enough with the pensions. They're not that difficult to understand. Um, so uh, so that's how I do it, Paul. I, I calculate it right then and there, and then I have their current income. I have what their pension income is going to be. So really quickly, I can figure out what that percentage is, and so I can say, okay, we're only going to be replacing X percentage of your income. And I can get John the form that I use for the state of Arizona. Um, and so you'll see right in the middle of the page up at the top, it has, you know, what school district they're with, uh, what their age is, what their date of birth is, why did they want to meet with us today? And then it has the, in the middle of the page, it has the pension calculator. So I can do that right there in front of them. And then at the bottom of the page, it has a gap analysis. So you can say, okay, here's what your gap is. Now, would that be an impact to you if you were uh, you were limited to only you know 47 percent of your current income and then when you open it up i print it out on 11 by 17 i fold it in half so it makes it one big page but it opens up and so on the second page you know you've got some space to put some spousal information 
you've got space to ask general questions about their risk tolerance. Um, and then on the third page, you have basically their, their um, a, a typical, you know, how much do you have in checking, how much do you have in savings? And I don't go through and ask every one of those questions, but when they start giving me the information, I have a place to write it down and I know exactly where to go on that form to write it down. And then the back page has some questions that are specific to educators like, um, are you on a nine month pay plan or are you on a 12 month pay plan? If you're on a nine month pay plan, do you have a, um, a summer savings account? So sometimes the school districts will have what they call a summer savings account because they're on nine months and they put a little bunny money in that summer savings account so that they can pay them during that time. So there's a few questions that are specific to educators and then there's also to schedule your next appointment and, uh, and the money commitment and you can write all that right there on the back and then you can actually schedule your next appointment right there on the back. Uh, of the thing it has. So I'll go ahead and I'll send that form out to John so John can forward that to you guys so you guys will have access to that if you want to use or, or make up a form similar to that of your own. So Kevin, then you are doing the Zoom meeting right off the bat. Now it turns out the last six or seven appointments I've had, half the time they were driving car. So I, I and in most cases I've been doing the phone meetings Maybe I need to switch to Zoom meeting and, and make it very clear to these people beforehand. I don't know how to go about it. I think they are getting confirmations from Para there's going to be a Zoom meeting, yet half the time they've been in the car. Okay, so I don't run into that, Paul, but I do have the text go out the night before. And I do have the email go out the night before that this is a Zoom meeting. Here's your Zoom meeting invite, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I literally probably only had one that they were actually in the car and he actually was running late from an appointment on his way home. So he just didn't get home by the time we, we were in the meeting. So he actually called into the zoom link, uh, that way. Um, so I, I don't run into that problem. I don't know how you want to address that other than in your text message, you might say something like, Hey, here's the zoom link. Uh, I will be you know, making myself available for that 30 minute appointment, please make sure this is at a time where you'll have, uh, you'll, you'll be at home in front of a computer and able to, to log into that meeting. Um, so you kind of set that expectation. Um, I, I don't know if you want to modify anything right now, uh, maybe see if that's just kind of a fluke that you got those five that did that, but um, if, it, if it keeps happening, you might want to do something like that in the text message, letting them know that that's being that sent over uh kind of set that expectation okay and the zoom you're doing with uh, your camera also or just only screen share oh I, I i don't screen share i i i'm not i'm doing everything on paper right in front of them so i i i set up i purchased a zoom camera set up uh polycom zoom camera zoom room set up for my conference room at the beginning of the COVID issues so um my secretary, my assistant goes in there right at five o'clock if the appointment's at five. She logs in, she waits for them to appear. Once they're in there, she says, okay, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. She makes sure that there's no technical issues. And then she says, okay, I'll go grab Kevin. He'll be right in. And then she just comes out and grabs me out of my office. I walk in there uh, and I sit down. And, and, I do. and, and then what are you doing? Are you writing on the board for them to see or how does it really happen? I'm not giving them anything where I need to write it on the board. I'm, I have a, the, the worksheet that I have is just a piece of paper that I have in front of me that I'm sitting there and I'm doing the calculation right in front of me. And I'm just telling them, uh, you know, what that calculation is. So I, I'm asking for information. I'm sitting there taking notes. Once I uh, have the information I need to do the calculation, I sit there, I have the calculator right there on the conference room table. I do the calculation. They can see me doing that. And then I let them know, okay, based upon the information we have here today, uh, when you retire at 65, your pension amount is going to be X, you know, $3,732. And then they write that down on their side. So it's it's literally just, just a visual presentation. I'm just taking notes on paper. I don't even have a laptop there in the conference room. I am just taking information on this notepad, um, on this, this worksheet. And then if I move them forward in the process, then you know we do the kind of the more complicated stuff later on. But this appointment is to pre-qualify them. 
So essentially, the camera is on you. They are looking at you, and they are watching you, and you are making notes. That's how the Zoom meeting is taking place. That's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, let's suppose you decide to proceed further, and since we are doing mostly now on online, and you need documents from them, and uh, and they have this statement and that statement, a lot of other statements. How do you get those statements from from the clients? So when I schedule the, the first appointment, the interview appointment with them, I let at the end of the pair appointment, I let them know they're going to get two emails. The first email is going to be their calendar invitation to our next appointment with the Zoom link in it so that they, they know they're going to see it and they get it and they click accept and it goes right into their calendar. The other, and I say the other email you're going to get from me is going to have two documents attached to it. The first page is going to be a checklist, and this is items you don't have to have them all, but I want you to know what items we're looking for so that you can kind of have those items that apply to you prepared and have those handy and ready when we're in our interview. And then that checklist includes, you know, a, a pay st statement, uh, you know, any investment account statements, 401k statements, all those. So that's all on the checklist, mortgage statement, all that stuff's there. Doesn't mean they always have it handy at the first presentation, but what I do is, as I go through the interview, as we're discussing their accounts, I will write down, I'll say, okay, so you've got a Morgan Stanley, okay, and I write that down. Okay, so you've got a Fidelity 401k, okay, and I write that down. And then at the end of that meeting, I say, okay, so I'm going to send you an email right now. I schedule the, the second one where I do, I'm going to give them the analysis. And I say, so what I need you to do is from the time you get me these reports, it's going to take me three to four days to prepare for your appointment. So um, when do you think you can have me these documents by? And a lot of times, oh, we can send those to you tomorrow, or oh, I've already got them prepared, I can send them to you today, you, you know. Okay, based on that, let's go ahead and schedule your appointment for next Tuesday, next Thursday. So you're scheduling that appointment um, based on the, the next appointment based upon when they're saying they're gonna get you the paperwork. So, uh, and then you just email them the list, and uh, I, like I say, 99% of the time they'll reply and they'll send you those documents. And if they have any questions or problems, then they'll reach back out to you. So it looks like we're out of time here, guys. Uh, I hope that helps everybody. Um, and uh, just that's how I apply the Paralead program to my investment advisory uh, practice. And hopefully that helped you guys. And uh, yeah, I'll send that document over to John and then he can forward that out to you guys. But Kevin, quickly, thank you so much. Yeah, Kevin, thank you so much for your time today. I greatly appreciate the time you allotted to us, and I'll be in touch with you soon. And thank you, everybody else, for uh, joining. And uh, if you could forward any additional questions to me directly, um, I'll, I'll be working with Kevin. And I, I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kevin. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you.